Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Sfarim Chatter podcast. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to be joined by Professor Emil Shriver, who is the General Director of the Jewish Historical Museum and the Jewish Cultural Court in Amsterdam, as well as Professor of the History of Jewish Cultural Heritage, and in particular of the Jewish Book at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, we'll be discussing Jewish book culture and the history of the Jewish book in general. So thank you, Professor Shriver, for joining me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Why don't you start off, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, so I've I've started my my career in in Jewish books or my life in Jewish books more so than in my career, my life in Jewish books as a as an assistant at the famous Rosenthaliana Library in Amsterdam. So the uh, after finishing my study of Semitic languages at the uh, University of Amsterdam in the 1980s, I started to work in this in this famous Jewish library in in, in Europe, which we typically consider, which we or which we like to call the largest Jewish library on the European continent. The truth of the matter is that I'm not sure that the Rosenthaliana is indeed the largest Jewish library in the continent, but since nobody ever objected, we continue to uh, to use that. The, uh, there's a couple of other important libraries of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, but for example, also the Fernaski Library in Kiev, which is also, uh, which is also here. Uh, the, they are probably bigger, and of course the British libraries are, are bigger. The, the 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 British Library itself, the Oxford Oxford University Library. So that said, it's an important major Jewish library in Amsterdam, built on the basis of a six thousand volume collection of a nineteenth century collector by the name of Lezer Rosenthal, uh, who died uh, in eighteen sixty eight, and twelve years after his death, these books were donated to the city of Amsterdam to become the core. Um, of the uh, of the the so-called Bibliotheca Rosenthaliana in Latin. Um, the Rosenthaliana, I, I started working there as a young assistant and was trained by by a great scholar of the Hebrew book who recently passed away by the name of Avi Offenberg. He is he was a world renowned specialist of Hebrew and Cun- in Cunabula of the fifth, books of the fifteenth century. And he basically trained me in Jewish books. And I wrote a dissertation on describing Hebrew manuscripts, started to work in the field, started publishing um, through the uh, through the Rosenthaliana. And after my, I, I did my, my finished my dissertation in the early 1990s, I started to work on a topic which for me has really, really become the core of, of what I'm doing, which is the interesting phenomenon of the production, the continuation of the production of Hebrew manuscripts since the invention of printing. And um, one of the things that that I have found in this field is that we have a great number of fantastic uh, specialists, uh, people who work in the field of medieval, uh, medieval Hebrew manuscript, medieval halakha, medieval illuminations, uh, Hebrew printing in the 16th century, but hardly anyone deals with the with the field as a, as a whole, and uh, so the g- generic approach to the phenomenon of Hebrew books is, as someone someone like like David Stern, who's now at Her- Professor David Stern, who's now at Harvard, he has this generic approach to the field as well, uh, and the the uh, of course he started the midrash and with all his all, all his important work in midrash, but he wrote a very important book on what he called the Jewish Bible and the transmission of the Jewish Bible. And for me, understanding the role of Jewish books in the transmission of Jewish knowledge is essential to the uh, to the work that I'm doing. And the understanding of the Jewish book as an expression of Jewish culture and of Jewish history. Uh, so, so if you tell the history of the Jewish book, and this is something that I talk about a lot with this same Professor David Stern, uh, the history of the Jewish book is a history of the Jews. You can tell the history of the Jews through the history of the books, and it's uh, I, I think that and that is that is essential to what I'm uh, to what I'm doing. Um, this generic approach was also probably the reason why I was. I came in touch with uh, through the immediacy of uh, of, of Adam Shear in Princeton. I uh, know in Princeton in in uh, well, not in Princeton. Where's Adam in Pittsburgh? In uh, so through the immediacy of uh, of of Adam Shear, I came in touch with Brill with the publisher, and we are now embarking upon a major project which we call the Encyclopedia of Jewish Cultures. 
So I have a, an editorial board and I'm the editor in chief of the, of the entire project. And this also goes to show this, this generic approach to my understanding of, of Jewish book history, not so much as the study of an individual book, not so much as the study of, let's say, the holiness of the Jewish book, but rather what was the role that books played in the transmission of Jewish knowledge in the course of the centuries, in, in the course of the, or in, in a variety of, 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 of places and, uh, and in a variety of genres. So this is basically where I where I am, but if I were to 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 define my actual field of of research, I would say it's the production of Hebrew manuscripts since the invention of printing. And why am I defining it in the way that I'm defining it? I think it's a very essential notion to realize that, that to, to to keep in the back of our minds when talking about this topic. That typically, if you look at the literature on Jewish books. People will say we have medieval jury and we have post-medieval jury. And we have, but but the invention of printing is an invention of the Middle Ages. So it's the late mid, late medieval invention. So what is vital for our understanding of the Hebrew book and for the transmission of Jewish culture, of Jewish knowledge through books is the fact that what happened after. The invention of printing in, in printing was invented in the, around the 1450s. First Hebrew books were printed between 1469 and 1472 in Rome and Italy. We have a total of some 150 books that were printed in the 15th century and the 50 titles that were printed in the 15th century. And what was the effect that that had on the Jewish world? Imagine. Imagine a book copied by hand is the the effort of a private individual or maybe of a group of individuals maximum, but the effort of a few people maximum, typically private individual, working for months, producing one copy of a book, leading to libraries, which even if we have talk about a couple of dozens of books, it is a big library in the medieval period. The, the uh, invention of printing suddenly led to the availability of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of the same text at the same time, at, 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 on the spot. I mean, you have one, one uh, copy of a text and suddenly you have 500 or 750 or 1,000. We don't know a lot about the numbers that were produced in the beginning, but this, these are the kind of numbers that we're talking about. And David Ruderman, a Philadelphian professor, Jewish history once called this the explosion of knowledge that was caused by the uh, by the invention of printing. This was an enormous explosion of knowledge, but it also led to a different phenomenon. It led to the consolidation of texts. If you have a you have a, a theory, especially in halachic works. There is a theory by which, which was coined by, by Yishal Tashema in, in Israel uh, in halachic works. There is this theory which is called the open book. The idea that a book is never really closed, that in the nature of halachic tradition, uh, a, a, a scholar can redefine his insights in the course of his career, or even within the same book. This is very famous Halachic work Ozerua by, by Yitzhak ben Moses of Vienna. Uh, he, he changes his opinion within the book. Why? Because it's a life's work. And uh, so, so the, this, this idea of an open book is, this is typical of halacha, but we see it in other, in other genres as well. Books get, get, more, get closed more easily once they are printed because of the dispersion of a standardized text through the medium of printing. So this is this is a very important important aspect of, of the advent of printing and of the invention of printing. And it had an enormous impact on Judaism. One of the uh, one of the examples that I always give is Talmud Yerushalmi. It's one of my favorite examples. Talmud Yerushalmi. We have uh, of Talmud Yerushalmi. We have one medieval text. And a complete text. We have fragments, we have substantial fragments, but there's only one complete 
manuscript of Talmud Yerushalmi. Um, the, this is the manuscript that was used by the printer, Daniel Bomberg, in Venice, who printed the first edition of Talmud Yerushalmi in, in 1520, I think, whatever, in the 16th, any, any, around 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, whatever, um, in, the second, in the second decade of the 16th century, the first printed edition of Talmud Yerushalmi. And he claims that he used a number of manuscripts. We know that he only used this one manuscript, which is then the manuscript, which is now kept in Lani University Library, not of the 30 kilometers away from where I'm talking to you. And um, it's um, and we if we look at the colophon of that text, which was copied in, in the 1280s in Rome, the scribe says that he copied it from a from a uh, from an exemplar from an example in front of him from which he copied, which was full of mistakes, and he tried to uh, correct to the best of his knowledge. And uh, he, so what we had, and this was the text that was used by Bomberg and which became the standard. So what we now consider Tamu Yerushalmi in this printed version, and Bomberg was copied and copied and copied and copied all the time. What we now consider as the standard text of Tamu Yerushalmi is actually a printed version of uh, a manuscript that was copied in the 1280s in Rome by a scribe who did his best to correct all the mistakes that he found. This is this is the tradition of knowledge. This is tradition, and there's there's hardly a better example than this. And and this is the tradition. And the the truth is, we can say, okay, you show me it's it's secondary to Bavli. The same is true of Bavli. We have only one complete manuscript of Talmud Bavli, which is kept in the in the in the Bavarian State Library in Munich. It's the only complete manuscript that you have. I once did a, a comparison of the Mishnah in the Bavli manuscript, the text of the Mishnah and the text of the Mishnah as we, we now appreciate is probably the best text which is a manuscript in in in, uh, in Budapest in Kaufman manuscript. It's full of differences. So the the so what what printing did, what printing did is that it stabilized uh, our texts, and now we consider them as canonical, or almost canonical, but they are actually the invention of printers, and the choice, or or at least the reflection of the choices of printers. Well, this is what really fascinates me. Fascinating. That's a fascinating example of the Yerushalmi. Um, and and I think that's something there that we, we should really go dive into a little more, especially for the listeners who may not be familiar. I think what's so fascinating is that many of the classical texts were, were, were set out, especially by Bomberg or maybe some by Sonsina a little before. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this in the history of the printing. We'll zoom in a little before we zoom out. But I think what's so important, I just want to mention this, is that people don't realize and Bomberg wasn't Jewish. Um, and, and for some people, they may not know this. And 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 all these, he, he set these, like you said, he used you know, whoever was setting the text and the editors that were Jewish, whatever, et cetera. But that become, like you said, canonical text. And suddenly they were set by who? And people don't even understand what, and, and they're running back to those editions. Now they used good manuscripts, et cetera, but we just, today we take it. And I, you know, you mentioned the Yerushalmi, I can think of three or four current new editions with corrections. They're all, almost all going back to Bomberg. And that's, you know, everything today is all based on that. So, which is what's really interesting. So, I think maybe we should zoom in a little before we get back to this and just give a brief. I mean, you mentioned Inconabola, which means a book printed uh, in the 15th century. So in the 1400s, yeah. um, uh, you know, you mentioned the Gutenberg invented the, the, the movable type. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, that and then the, the gradual state of, of, of Hebrew printing, you know, through Sonsino and Bombering in Venice. And then up until, I don't know, we, maybe we can go up until Amsterdam if you want where you are. So, yeah, no, so if, if, I, if I were to, because one thing that I want to keep in mind the point I want to make, and that is something that we should return to then after the printing issue, is the fact that what people do not realize is that, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries, but uh, as a matter of fact, into the 19th century, and maybe into the early 20th century outside Europe, in the Orient, uh, Jews have produced printed books, have produced printed books, but have continued to write by hand. And not only Sifri Kodesh. I mean, the, the, the continuation of, of the production of, of Hebrew manuscripts 
uh, it's something that is, I would say, understudied. It's it's that it, it didn't get the attention that 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 you would gather. Whereas, for example, in 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 certain Oriental communities, the majority of the books that people were using in the 17th and 18th centuries, even 19th centuries, sometimes was handwritten for the lack of printed books and for the lack of funds to produce printed books. So that is something that I find important. But returning to the to the to the printing, Hebrew printing started in, as I mentioned already, in Rome. Uh, there's a, a group of six books only. Uh, that we know were printed in Rome between 1469 and 1472. And the only reason why we know that they were done in Rome is because of the quality of the paper used. So there's a particular kind of paper used there. Um, and the, the, uh, the and this paper is the same paper that was used by printers in Rome, Schweinheim and Panatz, and non-Jewish printers in Rome. And we, so we know from the technical aspect of these six books that they were printed in Rome, that basically there were two specialists among us. There's one still alive. He's still alive. He's my best, one of my best friends. Uh, Shimon Yakasoni just turned 65, Mazal Tov, last week. And uh, Shimon Yakasoni is in, in St. Petersburg, and he wrote the catalog of the uh, Incunabula of the, of the JTS library in New York. So he's a great specialist of, of JTS books. Um, he has published a bilingual um Hebrew and English catalog of the Incunabula of JTS. I actually did the translation from the Hebrew into the uh, into the English, so I know the book quite intimately. And so the first they, they needed someone to translate it and have all the terminology right, and then they needed somebody to make my English native. So it, it was an interesting uh, interesting double bill. But um, that's that's sad. He he claims that he knows the order in which these first six were being printed based on the technical analysis that was going on. The other aspect, expert in the world is my former teacher, Adrie Offenberg, whom I already mentioned, who is the former curator of Rosenthaliana, and he passed away as short as two years ago. These two men, the two only specialists in the world in this field, already disagree on the order of printing. Of these first six books, so this goes to show the, the 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 lack of depth of knowledge they really have of this of this field. But there were six, so the, these first six books were printed in in uh, in Rome. Then the first Hebrew book with a date is dated 1475, and uh, and between 1475 and the period shortly after the expulsion from Spain and Portugal in the 1490s. Um, Sees the production of short of 150 editions. And the 150 editions typically would not have been larger than anything between 500 and, and 1,500 copies, uh, produced by a very small group of Jews. The estimates are, are very difficult, but we think that there were not more than 200,000 Jews living in the Mediterranean area in, in that particular period of time. So if you compare it to the 20 to 30,000 non-Hebrew books that were printed, these 150 books are nothing. But if you look at the, at, the, at the size of the actual group that produced them, it's quite substantial. And uh, at all important books were, or a large majority of the important books were printed one way or the other, with the exception. So there were Bibles, there were, there was, they solved the problem of absence in printing earlier than uh, many of the of the Christian printers, uh, because Jews, the, the, the Hebrew has a Nikud, of course, and the and the Nikud is 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 technically it's it's impossible. It's movable lead. So how are you gonna how are you gonna deal with the uh, with the Nikud? I mean that's a technical challenge, and the Jews solved that problem oftentimes before the, uh, for example, in Latin or in Greek, the 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 non-Jewish printers would be solving that. Um, and these, these 150 books were printed in, in Italy, never in Venice. Venice is a phenomenon of the 16th century. Were printed in Italy uh, by, most importantly, by the Sholcino family, members of the Sholcino family, Gershom Sholcino, a couple of others, Sholcino Salbanato Sholcino, a couple of others, uh, in, important members of the uh, Sholcino family, and, and in Spain and Portugal. Um, and there's one exception. One book was printed in Constantinople in 1493, Sabaturim, 
It was pre printed in, in 1493 in Constantinople, but there's a Shosino connection there. So the, and it's the earliest printed book as such, not Hebrew, non-Hebrew, whatever, in, printed in Turkey. So it's, or in, in today's Turkey. So it's a very important book. And the, uh, so that's, uh, I think it's December 8th of that 1493. I'm doing this from the top of my head, but, but it's printed in December uh, 1493. Um, the, so it's a very small group of books, but a number of very important decisions were already made that have, uh, that have defined the way that we use our books today. First of all, the, the layout of the books, if you look at the earliest printed books, these six books from Rome, and if you go on the on the Berginski Collection website, which we will be referred in the together with the podcast, you can see a Rome, an early Rome edition, uh, one of these six books, or six printed books. You will not believe that this is the first people ever printed. It looks as if it was printed yesterday. And uh, it's fascinating. So technically, the quality of the script and the quality of the layout uh, is already on, on, on an unbelievably high level. The, but there were a number of the, the most important decisions that were made consider the choice of Hebrew script. If we look at today's, of course, we know or we may not know that the, every, well, we do know every, if you look at a Sefer Torah from a, a, an Oriental community, and you compare it to a Sefer Torah from a Nashinazi community, you will see the difference in script. And the same is true of Sephardic script. Um, so these traditions of, of variety of scripts uh, are, of course, they started, of course, in the medieval period. And the uh, typically the first printers of Hebrew books were trying to make their printed books look like the manuscripts, because that's what that's the only model that you have. This is what people consider a book. So you try to make it look like a manuscript. But there is an element of standardization involved. You have to make a choice. In Italy, where there were Jews from, from Spain, where there were Ashkenazi Jews coming over the Alps, or where there were Italian Jews, you have to choose a particular font, uh, which you consider the most important. And the, the Shonsinos were the ones who decided that they would use the Sephardic script. Why? Because that's what's the biggest clientele. They so the largest number of clients who would buy their printed books would probably be, would probably be Sephardim, and they chose the Sephardic script. So what we today consider as our regular Hebrew script, not the Gothic kind of of Ashkenazic style, but the round, the beautiful round script that that is the standard script that we use today. That is a Sephardic. That is a, a an adaptation to print of Sephardic script by printers active in, Atl active in Italy. You're referring to the script that people know as Rashi script? Well, Rashi is, no, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the Kataf Muruba, about the, about the square script. Uh, that is Sephardic. Rashi script is another interesting example. What, what we consider Rashi script is also an invention of the Shotzinos. And it has nothing to do with Rashi. Other than that the script was uh, used for the commentary. So the Perush Rashi was, was, was printed in a commentary script, which is basically a cursive italic script as you have on your computer uh, in English. So you can, it's, it's a script that is different from the standard square. And of course, well, we know, we all know this from the Mikrot Kodolot, we know this from Bavli, when you have to, you have to, the, the basic text is printed in, in square script and the commentary text, Rashi, but also Ramban and also uh, Ibn Ezra and all the others, they will be printed in Rashi script. That's why it's called Rashi. But what is the background of this script? The background of this script is totally different. It's a, an adaptation to print not of the square script, which I already mentioned, but of the semi-cursive handwritten script, but of the Sephardim. It's a Sephardic script. And the, so it's an adaptation to print of Sephardic script. It has nothing to do with Rashi. Other than that, his commentary, Rashi could read it, I, I, I'm sure, could have read it, but, but he will never have used it. His script was totally different. So that is important. The same is, by the way, true of, 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 uh, uh, of what they call Weiber Teich or Yiddish script or whatever you call it, Teich, the, the script that is used for Yiddish, Ketav Tzur, Ketav Tzenerene, whatever you call it. I mean, there's different ways to call it. Uh, that's an adaptation to print 
of the Ashkenazic semi-cursor. So these, and these are all choices of these early printers of the 15th century. And what then happened is that uh, into the 16th century, so we have these small group of books, into the 16th century, the, uh, there was this, uh, I would say, businessman, more than anything else, from Antwerp, non-Jewish, uh, who, who uh, Daniel Bomberg, or Daniel van Bombergen, as you would actually be called in, in uh, van Bombergen, as you would actually be called in, in Flemish, who died in, in 1553, who, who spent, uh, who decided that there was a market for Jewish books and who sought a, a, a cooperation with Jewish scholars and started to produce books for the Jewish market. And he, his famous, he used the word, he used the name Bomberg, well, Bloomberg, Bloomberg, Goldberg. I mean, you could think he would be Jewish, but he wasn't. I mean, he wasn't. And the uh, he he was he was this Christian guy from Antwerp, and he he worked together with the Jews to produce the canon of their books. He worked together with with important Jewish scholars, and this was a combined result of his business uh, of his business instinct and a, uh, an interest that Christians in those days took in Jewish history and in the study of Hebrew. So Chris, it was also a phenomenon of Christian Hebraism, as it was called. The, uh, in, starting in the 14th century into the 15th, 16th, 17th century, you can see an enormous interest by Christian scholars in studying Jewish sources. Why? Because they had this ideal of what they call in Latin eruditio trilingue, the trilingual erudition. So the idea that their, their version of the Bible, I'm not talking about the Nacht, their, their concept of the Bible was one, the Hebrew Bible, second, the Latin New Testament, the, the Greek New Testament, and third, the Latin translation of both the Old and their New Testament. Um, the in order to study these texts in their in their original languages, they needed to study Hebrew, and they started to get in touch with Jews, with Jewish scholars who would teach them Hebrew, who would teach them Hebrew grammar, who would and they would they would they were actually quite instrumental uh, in Venice in the cooperation with Daniel Bloomberg, but also in cities like Basel and 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 Geneva and Paris where there were universities in the production of Hebrew books. So this is it's a very interesting um, cooperation between Jewish and non-Jewish scholars, which on the one hand was, I would say, a selfish effort on the part of the Christian scholars to produce the books that they needed for their biblical studies. But on the other hand, had the interesting side effect that the Jews created uh, a, a bulk, a, a group of, of printed, uh, printed Hebrew books that, that they could use. So, so, and, and so it's, it's, it's an interesting combined effort and it probably also needed the monetary means and the uh, commercial knowledge of running a printing office of a person like Bomberg to flood the world with all these editions that then later be, become the standards. And, the, um, and the, the, the layout of the Talmud, uh, page of Gomorrah, uh, as you read it today, is a page that, was lay, lay, that, 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 that has the layout that was developed by, by Bomber. A page of Mikrot Kodelot that you read today is a layout that was basically made by Bomber in cooperation with the Jewish typesetter. So that so this was this was absolutely vital to what to what was going on in this in this period of time, and he basically provided the Jewish world with all the standard texts for all the uh, important texts that we have, Midrashim and 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 Talmudim and Mikra Kudalot and all the commentaries that would never have been this, uh, and and this is where this this genuine explosion of knowledge that I mentioned before started. So I think this this is very important and. An interesting point that I would like to make for the earlier period in the in the 15th century, there you wonder why a particular book would be printed. 
So, so uh, because we have so scant information left of what was going on there. Um, we have certain books, we have a Rashi commentary in, in one copy. Um, uh, but we have Aferoes, which is a, an, an Arabic scholar uh, translation, the canon, uh, 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 Avicenna's canon, a couple of others, uh, other books that hardly every, anyone read probably. It's only meant for the scholars who would be interested in, in that particular area of research. We have 60 copies of that left. And why? Because nobody read it. Everybody read Rashi. So they said, I mean, they discarded it at the end when it, it, was, it became Shamus. And the Averroes and the Avicenna never became Shamus because nobody read it. So that's why we have them. So the, the presence of the, the, the presence of books, the, the remaining of books, the number of books, copies remaining of a particular book is no indication of its popularity. It's actually reversed. The books that we only have one or two copies left of are probably the books that we use most. But why did they ever decide to, to print these books that nobody read? You don't, I don't know. Maybe someone financed it, was interested in it privately. You never know. That, those are interesting questions. But Bomberg did a different thing. Bomberg provided the Jewish world with its canon. And that, that is not to be forgotten. Yeah, I mean, it's something interesting is that like you're saying with Bomberg. Not only what we said before that he provided with the editions of the actual text, but even the layout that we use today in every, there's new editions of, of Shas, of Gemara, of, of McCray's Gadel. It's that comes from that standard layout, which is which is very interesting. Another thing I would, I would pick up on, I'm sure you'd say this, agree with this, is that, um, about how you have so few versions of Rashi or other Jewish texts, is that also the persecutions and the, the, the banning and the censorship and the burning of Jewish books versus non-Jewish books also played somewhat of a role. I'm not, not downplaying your point. I'm just saying that also somewhat played a role there as well. Yeah, well, the, 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 the whole issue of this an interesting topic in the, in the interesting discussion going on among scholars on, the, on, on what, 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 what was actually the effect of, of, of uh, ecclesiastical church uh, censorship on the production of Hebrew books. There's a, there's a couple, of, couple of scholars who've dealt with this. Um, the uh, Amnon Raskokotkin, an Israeli scholar, uh, wrote, a, wrote a very interesting book on the, on the history of, of, uh, of, of uh, ecclesiastical scholarship and as uh, censorship and the, uh, the way that it influenced Hebrew books. Um, the 1553 is a crucial year in that respect. If you go to 1553 in the same Burginsky collection website that I used, you will see some documents that are related to this. 1553 is the year in which the uh, church decided, the Inquisition decided that the Talmud should be burned. It's one of the reasons why we have so few texts of the Talmud, as you indicated. Um, the, uh, and we know of book burnings on the Piazza de Fiori in Rome. We know of book burnings on the Piazza San Marco in Venice. We know of book burnings in Bologna, all taking place in this year, 1553. And, the, uh, and it came with a continuing interest in the production of Hebrew books by the Inquisition. And the Inquisition um, wanted, well, basically forbade the, 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 the printing of the Talmud, uh, forbade especially the inclusion of the tracted Avodah Zarah and references to the tracted Avodah Zarah uh, for, for obvious reasons. And it, um, it uh, but it also instituted a system by which the Jews were forced, printers and owners of Jewish books, in the course of the 16th and the early 17th century, were forced to report their Hebrew books and their activity in producing Hebrew books to the Inquisition. So they a, a reference to Rome, a reference to Edom, a reference to Hagoyim, would be considered as a negative reference toward Christianity and would be censored. And the Jews were actually forced to bring their books to, uh, to, to the censor, pay for that wonderful service. I'm saying this sarcastically. And, and then they would be returned their books. And sometimes you would have these, these sentences being expurgated, being crossed out. Uh, sometimes just a signature of the, uh, of the, of the uh, censor would have done the job. And the... Uh, Amnon Raskakotsky, who already mentioned, claimed that the printers 
uh, of Jewish books, started negotiations with the Inquisition at the press, at the actual printing press. When they were producing their Hebrew books, they were negotiating with them. And in order for them to be to continue to, to print prayer books, Bibles, books that they used, they allowed the Inquisition or they, they, they negotiated with the Inquisition to leave out certain texts from certain, certain difficult words or change text to the extent that they would be permissible for the, uh, for the, uh, for the Inquisition. Others, as a scholar in, 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 from Boxel, a Dutch scholar actually who lives in Oxford, claims that there's no proof of this. But it, 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 is, it is difficult, but it's, it's clear that the Jews were negotiating. And because these censors were Jews, or former Jews, converted Jews, many cases. They're because who knew where to find an anti, possibly anti-Christian passage in the Torim? It takes someone with a Jewish background to know that. Uh, so how are you ever going to do that? So, so they actually hired, uh, hired converted Jews uh, who would who would come up with lists of of, of passages that you uh, that 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 had that you had to be had to be careful with. So it's a but it's an interesting period. And what is this interesting side effect which I like to because you will always find the the, the signatures of these censors at the bottom of Hebrew books. So at the end of the Hebrew book, you would have the name of the censor. Um, there's a couple of very important ones, Camilo Yagel, uh, uh, four or five others, Luigi Bologna. There's a couple of people who, who, who will return and return and return. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of signatures of the same censors. And we're not doing anything else. It also shows that that particular book was in Italy in the 16th century. Uh, even if it's a book that, even if it's a medieval codex, we know that at least in the 16th century it was in Italy. And, and we know from that that there's an enormous concentration not only of printed books, but also of manuscripts, because these printers needed manuscripts. How are you ever going to print a book if you don't have a manuscript? If you're the first to print the text, you need a manuscript and to print it from. So, so there was an enormous movement of books in 16th century Venice. Um, and in this joint effort on the one hand of Jewish and Christian printers, and in this 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 how am I going to put it? This, this sense of animosity between Jews and non-Jews. On the other hand, this was the tension in which these books were being produced. Now, I think before we get back to, I want to get back to the book culture uh, conversation and the manuscript aspect of it. I think the one thing for shortly, um, we'll move out of Italy, there was more Italy to start, uh, printing, and then just because you're in Amsterdam especially, and so talk about the next major center of, of Jewish pr book printing, which was Amsterdam. Maybe you want to talk about that, that a little, and then, you know, We'll get back. Yeah, no, so so that that's so so basically so the Venice really was the was the center of the 16th century. I mean, there were a lot of other places. Basel was important. I already mentioned Geneva, Prague was important, Lublin. There uh, a lot of places uh, for the Ash within the Ashkenazic world, but the uh, but but v Venice was the absolute center. Um, of course, the big event in in the history of Faradim is the the expulsion. Uh, from Spain, 1492, and from Portugal, 1495-96. And the, uh, we know for a fact that, that the majority uh, of those who left Spain and Portugal stayed in the, in the Mediterranean basin area, so to speak. So they around the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, uh, the Balkans, uh, Italy, Southern France. But in the course of the 16th century, they moved, in the course of the 16th century, they moved northwards. And uh, at the end of the 16th century, early 17th century, we know the fact that some of the, the, uh, the Sephardic Jews moved up north to the southern Netherlands first, which is now Belgium, but also to the northern Netherlands. And uh, the first proof of Jewish presence, uh, presence of Sephardic Jews in Amsterdam is around 1596, 97. Um, the, this was a group of people who, part of whom had become Christian or had remained Jewish in the Christian world, but in hiding. So this whole story of the Maranos and everything, or the, which is a horrible word, but this whole story of the conversos, uh, the people who, who, who either secretly 
remain Jews or had, who had really been forced to return to, to, to move to Christianity, they saw, sought their new freedom in the Northern Netherlands in Amsterdam. Uh, but they also had to redefine that you redefine their Jewish identity. And the and part of that is of course the production of books, the, the provision of, of prayer books. The the and, and part of that was was provided for in, in Spanish and Portuguese, which was the main language. Um, but the first Jew actually to start printing for this newly formed Jewish community in Amsterdam is Manasseh ben Israel, famous Rabbi Manasseh ben Israel, whom Cecil Roth called Rabbi Printer Diplomat. Um, he, Cecil Roth, uh, called him that for a reason, but the first Jew, not the first in general, because there were Christian efforts to print Hebrew in Amsterdam, but the first Jew to print Hebrew in Amsterdam was Manasseh ben Israel, who printed a very small uh, Sidur for the Sfaradim, which appeared on the 1st of January of the year 1627. And that is the first Hebrew book printed in Amsterdam. And with his, uh, with his effort, and with the effort of a number of his important followers, uh, David de Castro Tatas, Immanuel Benvenisti, the uh, Josef Atias, uh, the famous Probst family, uh, which 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 was a very important family. With their effort, Amsterdam took over that role as the center of Hebrew printing that had been Venice's in the 16th century. And the this had to do with a couple of things. It had to do with the growing importance of this Amsterdam Jewish community. It had to do with the growing importance of Amsterdam as a city, not as a Jewish city, but as a city in uh, in world uh, uh, in the in the let's say within Europe in in world economy, but that was Europe your European economy. Uh, it had to do with the quality of the printing in Amsterdam, the quality of the quality of the paper, the quality of the illustrations the books would be illustrated, the uh, quality of the, the the amount of money that was available to do it. Again, also a Christian, Jewish Christian cooperation as well, and the um, the quality of the letters. So the quality of the Hebrew script, which was known all over the Jewish world, is Otiot Amsterdam. The Otiot Amsterdam, the uh, letters of Amsterdam, were considered of such fantastic quality that printers outside Amsterdam, in the course of the 17th century, in German places like 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 Frankfurt am Main, Frankfurt Oder. Zolzbach and into the 18th century would started to produce their book Botiot Amsterdam with the printed Amsterdam Hebrew letters which were Sephardic letters. I mean Manasseh ben Israel came up with them and they are not that different from the letters that the Schultzinos used and not that different from the letters that Bomberg used. But they were considered Otiot Amsterdam as a quality as a, as a sign of quality so to speak. So Amsterdam was really, it, it, it's about quality, it's about the quality of the text it's about the quality of the paper, the quality of the illustration, and the romance, I would say, of the city of Amsterdam. It's also romantic. There are actually, I think there are a number of books, I mean, I've seen that say Am printed in Amsterdam, and they're not really printed in Amsterdam, they're printed in Germany, and they're yeah. made it up. Well, it's, and it, sometimes it says, can it pass by Amsterdam, or it can say, but you Amsterdam, can pass by Frankfurt. Uh, so it, 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 this, is, this is very, very, very common. So the... Uh, so that's an interesting, but this goes to show the, the fame of Amsterdam Hebrew books, which is something that developed into the 18th century. And, and, you, and Amsterdam saw a decline of Hebrew book production into the, uh, in, into the 18th century. So that is, that is Amsterdam. And that, of course, brings me to my actual own field of research, which is that these printed books of Amsterdam, printed both, uh, or these books printed outside Amsterdam, but Otiot Amsterdam, with the letters of Amsterdam, um, became so popular that scribes, so Frieden, started try to imitate the printed Amsterdam letters by hand. It's the reverse. I mentioned before that in the 15th century, in order to be able to print a Hebrew book, you wanted it to look like a manuscript. Now, in the 17th and early 18th century, especially early 18th century, the, the, the scribes 
were trying to copy a printed book by hand. So the model had become the printed book. That is a very interesting phenomenon. And this is, this is the phenomenon that I've concentrated most of my own research on. Um, because why would you be doing that? Why would you want to copy? If you have a, a tradition of writing of centuries, why would, you, why would you go back to the printing and try to imitate printing? I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, a, an appreciation of the craft more than anything else. So the idea that people were, were, were capable of doing this was considered almost of greater importance than, than what they were actually doing. Imagine, try to copy a book. We all know we all imitate printed script. But sometimes it's very hard to tell the difference because these were fantastic of Freeman. They worked for, 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 the, for the richer upper class of, of European Jews who would give such books as a special gift on a bar mitzvah, on a wedding, they can be women's prayers, they can be kriyat shema, whatever, uh, uh, small prayer books or books of blessings, or mea brachot, or whatever. I mean, the, the um, Agadot, of course, these were typical gifts, luxury gifts, and they would also imitate the illustrations of the Amsterdam books. So they would also add illustrations. This is a, a, a I would say, a move away from the traditional religious conception of what a Jewish book is about. A Jewish book is about, at the end of the day, the large majority of Jewish books as we have them, the large, large, large majority of Jewish books as we have them, uh, beautiful as they may be, are about the content of the book are about the, 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 the content of the Hebrew text contained in the book and are about the importance of the transmission of that particular uh, portion of knowledge within the Jewish world. In these luxury books that I've been studying, 500 manuscripts copied by hand, Bot Amsterdam with Hebrew letters that look like printed Hebrew letters from Amsterdam, it's not about the content, it's about what it looks like. It's different. And it's a move away from 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 it, and, and, this, and this was done in 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 quite, uh, I would say, in quite religious in, in religious circles. I mean, an, an important figure in this respect is someone who you already spoke to in this in this uh, podcast with with uh, Josh Toplitsky, who, sp who spoke about uh, David Oppenheim. David Oppenheim was actually also someone who was not only interested in the content of the book, but also in books printed on crazy colors of paper or books combining uh so printed on blue paper who wants a book with black ink printed on dark blue paper you can't read it uh so this is this is only about luxury and or or books with 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 uh handwritten hebrew text but printed images or books with printed text and handwritten images so all this is all about craft it's an appreciation of the craft of art history, but not of content. You see, it's totally unimportant for the content. So this is this is what, and and why, and this brings us to the aspect of culture. It's actually a nice bridge to where we want to be going. Um, this is a phenomenon of the first half of the 18th, let's say, into the uh, into the 1760s. Um, it's also the end of it's it's a, it's the beginning of emancipation. It's the and of the 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 solely traditional the traditional approach to the production of Hebrew books, the nineteenth century is a totally different period. Nineteenth century is about about the fight between between tradition and 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 modernity, uh, and and you can see that already happening. So you can see that happening already. This move away from the traditional production of Hebrew books only towards the, the, the a combined production of the, all the traditional books that the Jewish communities were looking for, they were also printed. But there was also this small group of people who moved away from that. And that's, uh, and why am, I, why, am I, why am I underlining this? Because at the end of the day, uh, if you look at the overall picture of Hebrew books, not that this one beautiful Haggadah or not that this, this, this one beautiful printed edition, uh, the history of the Hebrew book tells you a lot about the development of Jewish culture. 
And that is, and, and this is a, a cultural phenomenon, an intellectual phenomenon, a religious phenomenon, a, a movement away from, from traditional book production towards a, uh, I would say, not necessarily very Jewish appreciation of beauty only. Um, that's a phenomenon of the 18th century that tells you something about the developments of the 19th. I'm, I'm not judging it. I'm just uh, mentioning it. And something I want to pick up on. You mentioned, first of all, you mentioned uh, Josh Topolsky's book on David Upnaim. He does mention, and I had him on the podcast, like you said. Yeah, a while I know, yeah, yeah. And, and he does mention there that he had a lot of special books printed on this fancy blue paper or something like that. Um, also, I, I just wanted to, 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 to you know, um, ask you this and, and to point out what you were saying. These are more of a niche product, right? You were saying like Rav David Appenheim was the, the chief rabbi of Prague, but he was a rich person. And we're talking about, obviously, the elite, first of all, these copying. And, and also, like you said, it's not for the content. So mainly what we're discussing here, these I mean, they illuminated the manuscripts or the man, they, they weren't just, you know, someone's copying you know, and just, you know, I'm, there were, but there wasn't just a lot. We're not talking about Shalos uh, Vachuvas or Allah Hasram just being copied and copied and copied. I mean, I'm sure there were, but I'm saying you're mainly talking about more of a... Yeah, what I'm talking about, because because this phenomenon interests me. Why the, 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 That's my personal research interest. The, my personal research, why, why on earth would you decide to copy a printed book by hand? Uh, and and what, what is the background of that? Because if you look at the text, it's very interesting. There's one famous collector in Zurich by the name of uh, David Jesuson, um, who who always he, who owns a couple of these manuscripts and and the uh, and he says if you look at the quality of the text even in the text of the Haggadah it's full of mistakes the text and, and the Nikud are, are the Nikud you can't use it why because they, they didn't care that is a very interesting problem so so the 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 outlook of the the actual outlook of a piece was apparently more important than it. that would not happen in the printed edition. So that is that is something that 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 I find really interesting. But we have to also mention it depends on the area. These, of course, are all liturgical manuscripts, um, and we all know the text of the Haggadah. So if there's a small mistake, uh, you notice that there's a mistake, and you continue. Uh, and if you don't know that, people know that know how to pronounce the 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 words in Haggadah. So the Nikud is not that important. But if you look, for example, at at at, at uh, Kabbalistic tradition, there were so many texts, Kabbalistic texts or Kabbalistic treatises or Kabbalistic notes by by famous scholars that have only been transmitted in manuscripts because they didn't want to print it, because they considered them dangerous to print them, or for the lack of sources to print them, for the lack of financial resources to print them. So the uh, so that so that, for example, is an area in which the the handwritten transmission of knowledge uh, remained prominent, I would say, into the nineteenth century even. So the uh, so so that is something that we also have to keep in mind, especially in religious circles. So so the the and 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 the, 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 the large variety of texts of of the famous Kabbalists are only available, uh, or or for a long time have only been available in manuscript into the nineteenth century. So that is something that we also have to keep in mind. So the uh, so it also depends on the genre and the manuscripts that, that fascinate me are those luxury manuscripts, and they also explain my my personal connection, for example, with the Braginsky collection in Zurich, which is which is a, a a famous private collector of whom we did a number of exhibitions. I would say probably the most important private collection of Hebrew illuminated manuscripts in the world. Um, with a an enormous number of these manuscripts produced by Otiot Amsterdam, these the luck these luxury manuscripts by Otiot. To give you a sense of what I'm talking about in terms of numbers, the the JTS Library in New York has 50 manuscripts that were copied by Otiot Amsterdam. The Israel Museum in Jerusalem has 40 manuscripts. The uh, National Library has 35. The Rosenthaliana has 30. HUC Library in Cincinnati has 30 manuscripts of this group. British Library has 15 or 20. René Braginsky in Zurich has 18 manuscripts, eight zero. So his collection is by far the largest collection of Hebrew manuscripts of this time. And, and I'm curating his private uh, collection of, of manuscripts. So we actually, in the new building of the National Library of Israel, which should be a topic of your 
upcoming, one of your upcoming podcasts is New Building. Library, the National Library of Israel will open a new building probably in the fall of 2022. Uh, in the right in the middle between Israel Museum and the Knesset in Jerusalem, a beautiful, beautiful new building. And the first uh, temporary exhibition that we will do is an exhibition of the Braginsky collection and the National Library collection. So this is the, another time that it will be uh, that will be published. Um, this is someone who, who 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 collects Jewish books. Uh, through his, as a result of his fascination for the variety. So with the first exhibition that we did, I did it together with Sharon Mintz of New York, the first exhibition that we did of his, we called A Journey Through Jewish World. Uh, and Jewish books are published in Yemen, Jewish books are published in Spain, Jewish books are published in North Africa, in the US, in Russia, in the Netherlands, in London, wherever. I mean, it's all over the Jewish world. So it's a diasporic uh, phenomenon. And that is, I think that is about most important to, to our topic. So I'm going to link, like you mentioned, to the Braginsky Collection uh, website. People can can check it out. Um, I, so I'm going to ask you now, as we, as we wrap up, are there any other links that I should mention? And also, if people are interested in this topic, is there anywhere they can read your uh, writings on this or any books, anything you want to, to refer them to? Yeah, well, the the there's one website which you which uh, you should probably also refer to is is it's chaimmanuscripts.nl, which is a very important website uh, because it is something that is connected to my my Amsterdam background. Uh, it's Chaim is the oldest Jewish library in the world, still existing. It's not the oldest library that ever existed, but it's the oldest Jewish library in the world. It was founded in uh, four hundred and five years ago now. Uh, 1616, uh, and it never stopped being active, with the exception of the five years of the Second World War, of course. But otherwise, the 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 the, the collection remained active, and we have all the manuscripts of that collection online. Uh, my own uh, publications are available. A large majority of my publications are available in academia. Uh, so there's this uh, academia with a C dot E dot edu. Uh, ed, ed, and I think I've I don't know exactly fifteen or twenty articles on the on this topic uh, available there. I think one project that I would like to mention is uh, a project of which we will publish in the course of this year, probably toward the end of the year, uh, a verse volume, uh, which is an encyclopedia of Jewish book cultures. And note the plural. Uh, so it's an encyclopedia of Jewish book cultures of which uh, which I'm the editor in chief, and of which we we will publish the first volume, which will basically be twenty articles uh, only on the state of research in on the history of the Jewish book. And so, where where is this field? What is this field heading towards? Um, the the Manuscripts are fascinating. The printed books are fascinating. The resources are are very. It's it's very it's very difficult to get a hold of all the resources that become available. One of my favorite one liners is that in the last ten years, I've been doing this for, I don't know, thirty five years, whatever. Uh, in the last ten years, I've seen more books online than I've seen in real life in the 20, 25 years before that. But I've seen enough real stuff to know what I'm looking at. So much of this is available online. But at the end of the day, the the and I think that is very important to for, for especially for students listening to this. At the end of the day, uh, knowing Jewish books is about preparing online. But go to the libraries and use the books. Go to the library and feel it. You have to feel a book. You have to smell a book, you have to hold a book, you have to, uh, in the non-literal sense, you have to taste it. And the, non-literally, so, so the, the, and keep in mind that with all the, with the enormous digital offer that we have, and I have to mention Petif, which is the website, which is a, a section on the website of the National Library of Israel, with the enormous amount of Hebrew manuscript, the, 
go online to the British Library and see the most fantastic Hebrew manuscripts online there. There's so many Jewish libraries that have, libraries that have their Jewish holdings there. But go and spend five hours studying an 18th century shas, and it will never, and, and an online experience will never be the real thing. So try to get to the original books when you can. Study, even if it's 19th century, 18th century, it doesn't have to be 14th century. Go to, study the old books and feel what it's like and sense the history that is part of the experience of working with old books. And it's different from online. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Shriver, for joining me. I appreciate it. My pleasure.